Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Based on your time zone, welcome in Salesforce Apex R. And today topic is become an order of execution hero. And our speaker is Daniel and Mark. My name is Amit Chaudhary. I'm the founder of the Salesforce Apex R and the organizer of the Farmington Hill Salesforce Developer Group. You want to follow me? You can follow me on Amit underscore SFDC or Apex R. <clears throat> Here is the list of uh, our upcoming session. Please register for that. There's a very good session coming in. Uh, next session is like how to leverage your forecasting. I'm glad that this time Salesforce Product Master is coming and they are going to talk about sales cloud forecasting. I hope you never heard about this session. So this will be really great. And there is a, a other a great lineup line we have like integration pattern and microservice. So please RSVP for that. You will find all the details from the apexr.com slash session in 2020. And all session recording you can found from our YouTube channel. So I will not going to take much time. So let me hand over to our speaker, Daniel. Yeah, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, I'm, I'm flattered to be more or less a, a resident guest this, uh, this January. Um, I'm a technical architect for DRD Interactive, a Salesforce partner in Germany. Um, I'm pretty much through all of the architect certifications and I'm heading for the CTA um, in the next few months. Um, I'm a leader of the Frankfurt user group and um, if you want to connect with me, um, there's uh, my Twitter handle, hard to pronounce for, for everyone outside of Germany. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, you find, can find my open source contributions on GitHub. Um, and on my side is my partner in crime for the order of execution, Mark. Yeah, hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark, I, am, uh, I have six certifications, not even close to Daniel's 20, but um, I work in the Salesforce ecosystem for 10 years now, and I spent five years as sales engineer, three years out of it working for Salesforce in Germany as a principal um, solution engineer. And I started looking into the order of execution, into the details, the, the, the hidden secrets six years ago, and um, developed this over the years. And it was a, a great pleasure to have the presentation you're gonna see today was the Dreamforce talk of Daniel and myself last year at Dreamforce. Daniel. Yeah, the, um, the, the fun story actually is, um, I learned the order of execution through a slide that I could extract from Salesforce. And it was only after I met um, Mark um, that I learned that this slide was originally written and composed and uh, researched by him. Um, and to be honest, if you look at this question, the question, how deep is your knowledge of the order of execution? You might scratch your head and say, hmm, I principally know this, but well, it might just be average. And, but for sure you have run into issues related to the order of execution or might be guessing that it is related to the order of execution. And after all, you might have seen what kind of issues you can experience from the order of execution. We for sure did, and this is why we um, stuck our heads together and tried to discuss um, uh, discuss things. And one scenario that Mark brought was really weird. Do you want to tell what it is, was about? Yeah, sure. Um, I was the CTO of a Salesforce implementation partner in Munich, a boutique partner. And some of the colleagues came to me and said, we have a customer with an org and... Um, we're in development and we, we face strange problems. We, we hit the save button when you create a new record and it's either duplicated or it deletes itself. <laughs> <laughs> and it was randomly. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we're shit. going to talk today about what there might have happened. Yeah, I might have an idea what this is about. Um, and let me tell you a story that I hit um, just the other day, um, a few weeks ago now. Um, a customer came and said, you have to fix your code. It's broken now. Um, it worked for half a year, but uh, it's broken now. Um, and here's the message. And the message was reading something like um, CPU time limit accepted, uh, exceeded. And this actually rang a bell. 
the um, it's a frequent story that you receive unexpected outcomes or is that you hit limits that you didn't in, uh, even know that um, you, you're going to hit with just a few lines of code that you wrote. And this is typically somewhere in an area that we call the order of execution. But what exactly is this order of execution? <laughs> oh, that's what we saw on Twitter and <laughs> It often has to makes the, gives the impression that it's going in circles, right? It's uh, and it goes in circles in very uh, weird and random ways. Um, so we actually had a good laugh when Daniel Peter found this guy from the uh, from the subway. You can probably relate to what's going on there. Yeah. Daniel. So. Yeah, you ask what is the order of execution? Let's start with a definition. Since we're Germans, right? We love definitions. <laughs> it's a set of rules that describe a path a record takes through all automations and the event that happen from save to commit. That is the official um, description. We're going to go through this um, in, in more details, but it's all about the automations. Um, and they obviously follow a path, right? So let's let's look into this and let us start with the official Salesforce oh. documentation. Oh. And yeah, you have 20 distinct steps. It's a lot of text. And um, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you looked into that um, at some point in time before. And what most people then ignore or do not really spend a lot of time on it are the additional considerations and that was actually was 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 me uh, which um, that was the point that got me started six years ago to looking into these considerations and to analyze and re-engineer what that actually means and this is um, all about today So let's, let's, let's consider what, what uh, goes to our head when we hear the order of execution. We did an experiment. We just dumped all the text of, um, that we just saw on the slides into one, uh, one piece of software that creates a word cloud. And typically that's what people say when, when you say, okay, that's all of execution. That's about validations, records, rules, triggers, workflow rules, process builder, record updates, et cetera, all of those things. And that's um, um, and that's really a mess. Let's probably go and see if we can sketch this out um, in a more understandable way. So we're, we were trying to what we were trying to do is bring all of this what you saw on that one piece of paper or in this word cloud into an order because we said it's a path that the record takes. So let's imagine envision this as a path that you see. You probably know all of the, the bullets here, it's just validations, triggers, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's all about that path. But that's still a lot of things to know and see and learn. But this is the full safe cycle a record takes from loading and editing it to being passed back in the database. But let's focus on the real important things where things actually can take a turn. And this is actually the triggers. Um, we highlighted the before trigger here. It's the workflow actions and it's the processes and flows. Most of you already know that process builder actually is a, another user interface for the flow engine and it is trigger flows that are triggered in a specific way. Let's say we focus on these three points. And if we dig deeper into that, um, these can actually change the record in the process is uh, in the path it takes to the database and by changing it they can define new paths that lead back to the beginning or back to the specific point in that full safe site and that's still simplified but you remember the, the key thing we're talking about today is that a record can take a path back and this is where things start go in circles or start spinning So why don't we, why don't we uh, move from uh, from the theory? Uh, That's for sure a good idea. To some scenarios, right? Yeah. So I we we that. we came we came up with the idea to have a scenario of, of three different um, 
three different things. So one is Cody. He sees the trigger. And whenever he updates a record, he's going to do update um, a house. When I say um, update, we want to paint a house. That means either Cody, Sassy, or uh, Astro are going to update the house. So the, the question is, is it's going to the blue trigger? Is it the red Sassy or the black Astro? Um, that uh, the first question is how many automations are going to run? How many layers of paint do we gonna have when we do this, when we execute it? Yeah, that's easy. That should be three to three. Yeah. And which automation runs last? Yeah, that's black, man. That's black, right. So we everyone the, the yeah. Everyone in the line, um, make your own opinion on it and what you think. So I think the really best thing we can do. Um, let's let's do this live and yeah, I paint that house black with the automations I, that I built. I put it on. So what we did is we created a, a very simple app, which is the, the the hero trail. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a new asset, and I call this new asset hero scenario number one. We're gonna do we're gonna have a second one later, and that is a, a child record of an account which is called hero. It's pretty simple. What we're going to see, and the, so a trigger is active, a process is active, and a workflow um, update mm -hmm. is active. We're going to see who was the last painter, the number of paint jobs, and the final color. This is what we're going to see. So let's save this, see what happens. And ta-ta, uh -huh. the color is blue, Cody won. And the uh -huh. number of paint drops is five. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's fine. So, so the question is why? And here we have the steps. There's a trigger, a workflow, a trigger, a process, and a trigger. Okay, oh. let's 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 analyze that a, a little bit. That is surprising, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's not black. I wanted it to be black. It's blue, Daniel. Hmm. Damn. So the point is, every workflow is causing directly a trigger to fire. The trigger then fires the process, and also the process always fires a trigger. Hmm. That is the order of execution. That is one of these considerations that is hidden. So the answer is five, and this is what happens. And these numbers, 3, 10, 12, 13, 3, are the numbers that are linked to the official Salesforce documentation that if you want to do your research afterwards, you can go in and you're going to see uh, the details itself. Okay. Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the of process builder. So I, I, I for sure want this house to be black. Um, I saw that you can have the process builder react to changes and evaluate your criteria recursively so why why shouldn't let, let's let's do this we we want the process builder to win uh, give sassy a chance i don't have i have my doubts but sassy should have a chance to win too so we re activate re evaluation for these flows uh, for the workflow rules and we act uh, activate recursion for the for process builder so it, it process builder will run for sure until the house is black Sounds like so this a good is actually, idea. Yeah, if you don't know where this actually um, where this is actually um, switched on, um, you can go to the um, workflow field update, and there's a little checkbox that you see there. Uh, Reevaluate workflows uh, rules after field change. You can simply click the um, activate it there. Um, for process builder, it's a bit more um, hidden. You see the uh, you can pull down the advanced section there, and you can hit the check books and there's a slight difference in the wording and we will refer to that later but um, the one thing that I want to tell you just now is there's a bigger impact and it is recursion called recursion for a purpose because it already says if you click on the help text that the same record will be re-evaluated for up to six times so six times should actually be able to beat the trigger I'm pretty sure Mark you're going to test this out, right? We're going to do. 
So the question again is, which automation ran last? Yeah, you all are mute, but I want this to be black. Yeah. <laughs> and how many automations are we going to have finally? <laughs> it will be how more many, than five, I fear. <laughs> how many layers? And we, we're going to tell oh. you it's 15. Yeah, and I... it's still blue. So Cody wins again. 15. What a surprise. 15. So the question is, mm -hmm. why? Why is it 15? So let's do a quick uh, another demo. And I also prepared that one here. So we're going to we're going to do that again. Um, I now call it scenario number two and I'm activate the re-evaluation that implies workflow and processes. Yeah. And let's hit, hit the save button again. And oh. here we are. And we not I'm not really sure everyone can read it. So this is the order the detailed order down to yeah. 15. So there's one workflow and a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between black and blue. Yeah, wait a minute. There were just one left uh, red ones. Yeah. Look at that. Amazing. So what we see here, the workflow, even the checkbox is on for re-evaluation fires once. And there's mm -hmm. a ping pong between trigger and processes for six times and then it ends. So after six, it ends. So that means we have in total eight triggers, the one workflow, six process builders, and that sums up to 15. So what is it we can learn here? Or one of the first things that we as developers need to understand. Let's talk about workflow, only the workflow. The same workflow won't fire again after it has fired once. That's important to know. That's a big difference to processes. Um, when you activate the re-evaluation, it could fire another workflow which hasn't fired before. That's the big difference. Another thing to consider is, which, which could be surprising, if you have custom validation rules implemented, they won't be checked. If you have duplicate, sus, duplicate rules in your system, they won't be checked. Yeah. So, so it's limited that, to system validations only mm -hmm. and uh, before and after trigger. Yeah. That is so what, I, what's fine. Interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. So you mean if, you, if I want to catch something like a color that is set later, um, it won't be caught by a validation rule that I created for that color. There's exactly. no way to stop that. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Mm. This is what happens. Um, yeah. So you, you should know what you do. Let's talk about the process. And here it's different. And this is why we also changed the path. It goes back to start more or less. And it goes through the update. So system validations, custom uh -huh. validations, and uh -huh. also the duplicate rules are fine again. Say what? So um, interesting, isn't it? So th that's one of the differences, but this is... A second one, which you should know, assignment rules and auto response rules okay. are not fired again. They're only fired the very first time you, you cross this pass. And after that, they ignore everything else. So it's only step two to seven, the six steps, which are implemented within the process flows. That means for you as a developer, if you start using the iterations, the recursions, know what you do, and you should have this under control to avoid a lot of execution runtimes, DML executions. We're going to talk about that later in our talk. Daniel, can it get any worse? Oh, uh, you bet it can. Um, there's a construct in the uh, in the programmer's world that is called trigger old, and trigger old is by definition the um, the state of the record before the trigger was fired. Um, there's a lot of myth about the trigger old um, variable and um, some people say it is not updated at all in a, in a safe cycle. So here's the question, is it updated? And if so, how often? And the answer is, most people probably don't know it, it's 
probably updated. Let's have a look here. We have that, um, we have a counter on these, uh, object, uh, on the record that we saved. And it counts the layers of paint. Um, to be fair, it counts how often this, uh, the color changes. And you can see while it goes through that path, the counter is increased. After the, um, the, it ran through the first uh, trigger, it counts to one, then goes up to two, to three, to four, to five, etc., and so on. And this should be somehow reflected in trigger old if it changes. Yeah, let's have a look what happens to the uh, to trigger old. You can see after the first change that was if, um, uh, that was cre uh, done by a trigger, it is counted to one. That sounds familiar, right? Um, and then we go to the workflow rules, and it's, uh, it should be the, the variable is two, whereas trigger old remains at one. So process builder's turn. Um, it is increased to three, and you heard that the save cycle is fired again by the process builder. So no wonder trigger old is set to three by that time. It goes, it goes back and hits the, I'm sorry, the blue one was a was the after trigger. And then it goes into process builder, a declarative tool changes the value and the value is at four and trigger old still is at three until it goes into the before update trigger again and it is at the correct number. So this, we painted this red because this is somehow weird. Workflows and process builder field updates do not update trigger old while the trigger old is updated through, the, um, but in a weird way. And this actually can cause you a lot of trouble. And I mark, this must be a bug. I mean, yeah, it how must on be earth? A bug. This is what we thought. And then we started the, an uh, exchange with the Salesforce um, Apex product management team. And uh, we, we had long discussions on it and we found out it works as, as designed. What? Yes. So, um, and if you, knowing this, you will understand some of the considerations, which I didn't understand, even I read it 20 times. So mm -hmm. this is one of these hidden things in the considerations. So yeah. you as a developer, you need to know that. That it this could cause right? you some, it is dangerous. It is dangerous. Yes, so trigger old might not tell you the truth. Ooh. So the, the question is, why is it like that? Uh, we also did the, the research on that and that was confirmed by the Salesforce product management team in San Francisco. Um, every time you hit a before trigger, that is the time when the platform updates trigger old. Mm -hmm. So you need to actually pass the before trigger and when all the before triggers are fired, it's updated again. Mm -hmm. So this is this is actually where it happens. So it's pretty simple, but it's, it's, it's simple if terrible. you know it. So it's one of the things. <laughs> it's it's good to know actually when when you start building. So Dana, we we learned all that, but um, how that, how does it actually scale? We mm -hmm. were looking at one record, one save cycle, but um, there might be more, right? Holy shit! Yep. And the, the ugly truth is that with a lot of things that you can do, you start new safe cycles. And this can happen from the before trigger, from the after trigger, from the workflow actions. I mean, you can create a task from workflow actions. If you have a trigger on tasks, this trigger will be fired. Processes and flows can update related records or unrelated records, whatever you design there. And one thing that people don't have in mind, um, also roll up summaries will be calculated in that safe cycle and not just for the parent record, but also for the grandparent record. So all of this will kick off new trigger executions and will affect more and more records in the safe cycle. So you're not just going through that safe cycle for the record that you entered, um, you also go through a full safe cycle for all the records that you touch while going through the, uh, your own safe cycle. It yeah. will affect related records. That's potentially a very 
ugly situation that can arise from that. Yeah. To me, that is one of the key slides we and then the key key things we have in this presentation. And I'll tell you why, because if if you write some code on your platform, you could control all of this. That's fine. But it's, it's also pretty likely that you're gonna have some app exchange packages installed. Oh. And they gonna execute I don't want to say randomly, but you can't really control which 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 trigger fires first. Mm -hmm. So this is all it all has some dependencies between. So um app exchange packages, if they're controlled or uncontrolled, your own code. Um yeah, this is something to consider. The second thing is, and we won't go in detail. Uh, here because it, it is it would be another talk of 45 minutes is the record locking itself every time you touch oh. a record it's locked oh, yeah. and it's a it's a beast and we're going to link to a record locking cheat sheet um, in the in the very end um, consider all the lockings it might cause you other problems which you need to consider and knowing all this there's one key learning is you need to do a lot of testing not trying, but real tests. And that means you need, you should, when you do the automations, you should test with a lot of data to see how does it actually, it, it might work with 100 or 200 record, but what about 10,000? That's right. Will that, right, will, will that cause some problems? And that is actually what, what happens in real life. You test it with a five or 10 records. And after half a year, the org gets more data and it starts crashing because it didn't test it good enough. So, what happens if something goes wrong at any point in time the, the black one the, the the bold items here that's when something could go wrong it simply returns to sender everything is set to zero as it never happened um, auto auto number fields are uh, reset so nothing actually happened you just lost you get a, a error message and that's it that's um that's a good thing there's a full rollback if it's a really full rollback, well, maybe I'm going to talk about that later, but first of all, it returns to sender. Mm -hmm. Daniel, we, we will start talking about limits and, and errors. So as we all know and love, there yeah, are sure. limits on the platform. Can you tell us something about it? Exactly, exactly. The one thing you should keep in mind is that there is, uh, and an, at another point, um, I explained this as a kind of vector, a vector of um, the number of records that enter a transaction and the number of records that are affected from the by the operation and this could actually um, be much much more than 200 records um, if you touch records um, through triggers and um, the things that we highlighted just a while ago um, you have to imagine um, that the limits are designed for your whole transaction um, the, the whole way through that cycle and the limits are designed um, quite generously if you calculate that for one record. Um, but they are really narrow if they are calculated for 200 records in that operation. Um, so that's a full execution context. And um, if you have to share this with, um, with, uh, with managed packages, like as Mark said. So, what you have to keep in mind is that um, CPU time limit um, is definitely has to stay under 10,000 milliseconds. A, a dangerous thing is that CPU time is kind of a soft limit. When you hit it, it's a hard limit. The transaction is over, but the transaction is not over at exactly 10,000 milliseconds um, for sandbox orgs and for scratch orgs and for production orgs even the limit can be over 10,000 milliseconds, but you're not guaranteed to get more than 10,000. And um, so if you test things, um, especially if you uh, test with large volumes, watch out for close to limit in the, uh, in the debug logs, because it says your CPU time might have run out, but you had more than 10,000 milliseconds at your hand at the moment. So the platform didn't kill you but it would have killed you if the limit was strictly enforced. It's something you need to know. It's a limit that is soft at um, soft in terms of the exact number of milliseconds assigned to you, but it is a hard limit as soon as you hit it. And it can be any number above 10,000 milliseconds. Um, 
SQL queries and BML statements, as you probably have known in uh, learned in the early days of Process Builder and Workflow uh, and Flow, are hard limits. Whenever you go over 100 or 150, uh, you're dead. Uh, same goes for the SQL rows and DML rows. Um, that's um, simply something that you have to keep in a hidden if you in mind. So the question is, how do you actually monitor this, and how you do you actually debug this? Um, you might know the debug log um, already, um, and you might know the developer console. One of the things that is really good in, uh, in the developer console is the visualization options. You probably don't know this. Um, if you don't know this, just experiment and set the debug level in the um, to for profiling to finer. Um, and then um, you can open the same log in the analysis perspective. So it just saves more in terms of granularity. And if you open the anal analysis perspective, you will see a visualization of the operation. And here you can see something that is ping pongs back from purple to orange, from purple to orange, from purple to orange, and from purple to orange. So as you might have guessed, this is exactly what Mark has shown you in the demo. This is a, a real log from the demo. I even have the validation rule that tries to find out uh, and tries to prevent the house from being painted blue. And you can, as you can see, the validation rule ran twice, but not at the moment the process builder painted the house black. Um, so this is exactly what I did to debug the customer problem that I told you just a while ago. Um, the code worked in the past, the code works now. And I was looking in the debug log and saw something like this ping-ponging back and forth. And then I, when I see something like this, I go back to the process builder in, um, in the system setup and have a look on uh, the creation dates of the process builders. And yes, there was a new process builder. And this is the reason why my customer had that problem at that time. Um, and the easiest way to fix this was deactivate the process builder and educate them how to build uh, failure proof with clicks and code, some of my other favorite topics. Yeah, and maybe one thing uh, to add here is uh, the debug log um, lists processes as workflows. Uh, we also discussed that. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, that's You're an right. historical thing, and they they might or might not change it um, at some point in time. Yeah. Oh yeah. So when good it says good workflow, good it's it's also a process. Don't don't get yeah. confused here. Oh, good. Um, Thank you. Good. So we learned what your problem caused. Let's let's talk about mine. <laughs> oh what no! Oh no! I see where this is going. Yeah. What could have caused my, my problem? Um, for sure, multiple triggers on the same object. The, the team had six different triggers and uh, several six. workflows. Yes, yeah, six <laughs> processes. There were two processes oh, in it. Um, they, they didn't build it straight into production, but it's something we all have seen in the past. And um, additionally, and that was one of the root course analysis, there were too many App Exchange packages installed with a similar functionality. And at, mm -hmm. at one point in time, the, the custom code fired. Then the next time, um, an app exchange package fired first. So that, that caused the problem. That was all not under control. After we did the research and we knew what we actually want to have, we were able to sort it out. But knowing about the automations on the platform, it took me 10 seconds to know where I have to look, which um, probably saved me a few days. Mm -hmm. Good. So. Um, let's talk a moment for everything that happens after the commit logic happens. After the very last step, oh, all the yeah. records are committed to the database. It's all good. So what, what is going to happen actually then? Mm. And um, I'm not... Documentation says email. Well, it says email, yeah. For, and the, the documentation says um, there are more. more things happening. For example, emails. Uh -huh. So on this for yeah. example started me actually collecting what is lot. happening um, as well. So at future methods, okay, that's that's simple. We we most probably all know. Um, one thing I didn't know is asynchronous sharing rules. If you have more than, if you need a sharing rule for more than twenty five thousand records, which is a lot, it is calculated asynchronously. 
so oh. not in real time. It's interesting. It's also from a security yeah. point of view. Um, you should know. Mm -hmm. um, outbound messages from the good old workflow days, they're fired afterwards. Um, all kind of indexes are calculated, such as the search index. So your record might not show up in the search immediately. This, that's the reason it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's asynchronous. All previews, uh, when you do a um, um, chatter previews, they are mm -hmm. calculated. And then I teasered the, the rollback things. If you fire an event which um, during the execution, um, if, if one of the uh, triggers fire an event, the event is gone. Mm -hmm. So if you build an integration with real-time events, which are fired by, by uh, Apex code, the event is gone. So you should so, really know what you're doing. So this is what the new switch on platform events is about. It fires either after the commit or immediately in the transaction. And whenever something fails in the transaction, it's gone, you're saying. It's fired. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's really something you have an eye shouldn't have an eye on when you configure platform events. Should this event be fired after everything finished or should it be fired immediately? Yes. Exactly. Ooh. Yes. Something that's... you should know what you're doing, um, as always. Mm -hmm. So what, what are the lessons learned? Let's let's summarize actually what, what our learnings were. Um, our recommendation is check the official Salesforce documentation with every release, with each release and understand the fine print um, with the consideration. The rule of thumb, if you build something, one trigger and one process per object. If you can avoid workflows, uh, our recommendation is to not use workflows anymore. Go with one trigger and one process in it. Why is it? Because you can control what's actually happening mm -hmm. and the order in it. No and law of the debug lock. Mm -hmm. or, or, or at least know someone who knows how to how to help you if you need to to box, to debug something. Watch out for this close to limit, and that means even when you do a lot of testing, nothing you don't get an error message. You need to go actively in and look out for this close to limit um, entries to see it could cause a problem in the near future. Another learning is try to avoid situations where you could run into this back and forth ping pong loop thing. Or when you do it, you should know what you do. Mm -hmm. The trigger old, handle it with care. And my recommendation personally is start, if you, if you don't do that, start testing with a lot of data. And mm -hmm. remember to test with all packages and enough data. Mm -hmm and retest. So if you touch automations, let, let the test run again. It's, it's yeah. critical. One thing that you, um, one thing that is probably worth mentioning, uh, when, you say, when we say avoid situations that could loop, um, the one situation that could loop is the thing that we had in our demo. When you use field updates in process builder or workflow, it will fire the trigger again. The trigger oh, is designed yeah. to always run after all other automations again. So any declarative change to a record in the process will fire a loop into the trigger relentlessly. The trigger will always win. It's designed to win. So um, it's a catchy phrase to say avoid situations that could loop. And that actually means be very careful when you make declarative changes to the record in your process and know that it will fire your triggers again. That's probably one explanation worth mentioning again before we proceed to the learning resources that you could find for, yeah. the, uh, for the topic. Yeah, especially when you do things like uh, creating uh, additional records or you increase mm -hmm. the value of some fields, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so <laughs> control, control the controllables. That's oh, a big, yeah, right. big learning, big, big learning. Good. Um, okay. Before um, we come to the question and learning. Learn yeah. yeah. Oh, another one. <laughs> I thought you were mentioning, uh, you were about to mention something else. No, so no, go ahead. It was actually the handover to the resources before oh, we do wow. the Q and A session. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. 
So you, you probably want to um, want to look deeper into the topic. And the disappointing thing in um, um, the disappointing thing is that there is no such no immediate um, traded module to learn about that. Um, you should definitely try your luck for yourself um, with the official developer documentation. Um, I really, I really don't like the fact that the order of execution is, explain, is explained only in the developer documentation because it is for developers and administrators and app builders all the same. What you, what I would like you to do is go into um, the developer console basics module where you learn about how to work with the developer console that gives you the basics and the fundamentals to actually debug stuff, even as a non-developer. Um, and another thing that is very interesting is um, there's a batch that's called Apex and .NET Basics, and there they explain the transaction and the execution context for developers that are not trained on the Salesforce platform. And this is a great resource, even though the name doesn't hint at execution context, order of execution, whatever. Um, they try to tra um, give developers from another platform a kickstart into how Salesforce works. And this is a very valuable badge, actually. Mark has mentioned the record lock and cheat sheet. Um, you can find the link there. Um, this is a valuable read if you uh, really want to know how the database behaves when you change records. And this is crucial for anything that is going to be large scale in your applications. Well, a shameless plug as well. Um, a person you might know by now, which is me, um, has uh, done a pluralsight play-by-play -play with Don Robbins on the topic of the order of execution. Um, and as you see it here, um, there's also a free trial that you can get through Don Robbins. So if you sign up for Pluralsight through Don Robbins' site, um, use the bit.ly, use the QR code, and um, then you'll get a full 30 days free trial for Pluralsight if you haven't signed up before. Um, and this is a, um, a nice giveaway. Uh, if you manage to watch all the Salesforce play-by-plays the, in this free trial, you will be a hero. You'll probably completely binged, but this is um, this is your chance to get it completely free. Um, yes, and that's probably it. Next time it spins in circles, you probably know why, and you probably know how to start fixing that. Um, and with that, um, feel free to reach out to us and connect with us. Um, here's our. Um, Twitter handles, here's our email addresses so that you can drop us a line if you um, uh, for, if you want to write us. And um, we're open for your questions. I saw that there is a, Adrienne um, had, a, had a note that the trigger can recurse up to 16 times in depth. Um, that's, that's true. Um, one comment here, um, the, the 16 is actually also the execution depth of the, the trigger. You can touch a record in the same transaction twice, but if you do that twice, um, you'll get a trigger recursion. And this is actually what the 16 times uh, is ref referring to. Um, it's a deadly uh, deadly deadlock <laughs> uh, and the, the, a, plowing, a transaction that flows really up. Um, so that's a terrible thing. If you load the same record in the after update or after insert trigger again and edit it, um, that's terrible. So, any other questions from your side? Feel free to shoot your questions, unmute, unmute yourself and shoot your questions or write it them in the chat. That's a big one. Um, so, the um, the first que uh, one question here is um, in a demo we have had a recursive flag on the uh, on the asset record. But yeah, that's um, I'm glad you noticed this because it's a detail. Um, what I did is um, build a criteria in um, in the process and the workflow rules, um, and we can probably um, show the configuration of the um, of the process. 
um, the um, I pre-built two processes and um, it first re -eva evaluated is this checkbox set and it gated the the whole process to the one path or the other one path it's a it's a tiny trick to make it um, easy to handle the situation in a demo yeah it's 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 a it's a demo setup yeah um, the, the second question is what is the criteria based on which we decide if a workflow or process has a re-evaluate flag checked? Um, the, um, the, I'm not really sure um, what you actually, what you, uh, the, the question is actually about. The, um, is it, um, do you mean, why uh -huh. and in which situation should we use the um, this thing? Or right, right. Hi, look this side. Yeah. So basically, the question is uh, when we should use this uh, re-evaluation criteria. Mm -hmm. That's um, that's quite a um, when. What what would be a good use case to do so? Would be, yeah. So I, I give I give an example. Um, where where it's often used is when you do some kind of product price calculations, a multi-step process, where actually um, you update it and based on this update, it goes into the next calculation, doing the next lookup, and that might cause you to, you need to do similar or the same processes two, three times in a row. You calculate a new discount, discount calculation, for example, might be a process. So it depends, and the point is, what, what I recommend is you should know that you can do that and you should know how the workflows behave or the processes. And the point is with this processes, this is why I have it open here as well. And um, if you have good criteria in it, you can have one process, even the same process fires again, but the execution line um, in this case, what the first one wouldn't fire again because you handle it with some values on the record itself. Um, multi-step multi -step things such as calculating a pricing or generating an order, things like that. That's a good example. Mm. So, and there was a, um, a third part of that question. Um, a as a rule of thumb, we should have one trigger and one process. Can we send outbound message using process? Um, I'm pretty sure outbound messages are a uh, an option in in process builder actions. I haven't built it in process builder uh, to be fair uh, I and honest. I think oh. you can't. I think it's, can't. it's a it's feature. Not, it's not no, there. I think it's a feature okay, that good. that was built for workflows only. And to to my knowledge, it's actually the only reason uh, to use workflows um, anymore if you want to use an an outbound message. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> yes, okay, our my uh, are not available. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it had, isn't I, and it won't be. So the, the product manager yeah, yeah. clearly said they won't build that. They don't want to have yeah. it anymore. Okay, they don't, don't even want to port the outbound messages. That's interesting. No. Wow. No. The um, my assumption was that the um, as email actions and field updates uh, as email actions can be used from uh, for rules to process builder. I have the assumption that we can just pull it over. Um, from the point of CPU time consumption, um, there's still a good point using workflow rules over process builder, by the way. But the one key thing is actually to um, be aware of the, the limitations that come or the, the risks that come to field updates, uh, come from field updates in process builder and workflow rules. Mm. The, the question is um, another question. To check the safe order in the analysis perspective of debug logs, we should have finest for what all components? Is it possible to do a quick demo of it? Um, the, what you have to do, and I have to add least, is finer or finest for at least profiling. Um, that's, the, that's the crucial thing. Um, you can also set to finer or finest for any other um, thing that supports uh, finer or finest. Um, but Mark, could you just open the developer console? 
please, so that we can uh, um, show where do you set profile, um, the debug log level. Yeah. You can set the debug log level in the setup interface as well, but that's not so nice. So that's debug. And there's change log levels in the bottom. Exactly. So, and you, um, you can just add change the, the uppermost general log level. Add change in the top row. And there you go. Um, profiling is finest here. And this is the, um, the setup that we are used to capture this, um, to capture this um, log that we showed in the demo. So it's profiling to finest and any other things at your own um, discretion. Know that the log level actually um, influences the, um, the CPU time consumption. So whenever you do logging at that level, your CPU time will go away even faster. Um, so that's something you have to have in mind when you're debugging CPU time exceptions. Um, log le uh, high log levels will blow your CPU time additionally. Um, oh, uh, a nice one. Is there any documentation or any written statement about Salesforce not recommending outbound messages? I'm not really sure of that. I'm, I uh, read it in, in one of the, I don't know if it was the official documentation or a product yeah, yeah. management blog post. I'm pretty sure I read it. So the official recommendation, mm -hmm. even in some okay. of the new um, uh, trails uh, on mm. Trailhead, is um, don't use workflow. Go for process fees mm. for for future for future reasons and performance increases, etc. So processes they got introduced two or three years ago based based on flow mm. and that that is the future that is the future yeah. and rumors saying that processes and flows and the two uis we we have are going to be merged into one by next stream force mm. that is this has been on a um, on a pm slide uh, indeed so yeah. um the, the the key improvements in process builder will be that um, in the flow engine will be that the flow engine will um, in I'm not sure if it's already in the um, in the spring release will get a flow trigger back again um, the second thing is that um, flows will get a b4 context uh, more or less um, that gives them the ability to read into the values um, of the record affected before it um, it's actually ever hit uh, without any uh, SQL query. Um, if you look closely into the logs, Process Builder always makes a SQL query at the beginning of the transaction. So this behavior will change. And I think by summer is um, something's on the on the roadmap that says there's a, a user interface change in Process Builder, which is most likely that process builder is going to be merged with uh, with flow and the new flow builder interface. Hey, um, can you please explain, safe harbor, safe harbor. Uh, Sure, go ahead. Yeah, can, can, could you please explain more about the financed and, uh, and the debug log levels? And uh, what should I use on this uh, when I was debugging the uh, I am debugging the CPU limit exit time? Mm. Um, I would I would go for um, I have set uh, finer or finest here for the most um, for most details. Um, if you are after a um, um, a CPU time limit exception, um, profiling for the for your first impression set to finer or finest um, is mm -hmm. um, is already enough to get a, a visual idea about how this um, transaction behaves, um, mm -hmm. and only after that, um, only after that, you can uh, you'll step by step increase the um, the levels into the other processes. Um, mm -hmm. The analysis perspective gives you um, a good overview of who actually or which component ran and how much time it took so you already get a first pointer at where um where your time uh, you burned a lot of time so you don't need the details of the other things um in um in the um 
uh, you don't have to need to have the other ones uh, set to finer or finest at the same time. Um, the first pointer that you get from the length of the, the colored bars or so um, should already be enough to, to let you dig deeper. And you can see the ping pong or things going back and forth. Um, that is a, another good pointer to, um, to an, uh, analyze, analyze the, the transaction. Um, so you don't need the other stuff. Um, so in that very specific scenario, if you want to find out where your um, CPU time goes, uh, profiling to finer or finest is already enough to, to get a very good impression on what's going on. Okay. <sighs> I... On top of it, like uh, Daniel, I also want to add one more point here, so which I always love. So <clears throat> in this kind of scenario, like there is also one, one good scenario in the order of execution. Like I, I will love like who will answer that question. So just assume in my project, uh, one of the developer create one validation rule on a portuity, saying that a portuity amount should not be greater than 10,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is one developer did and top of it, I have another developer who created a time dependent workflow. It's a time dependent <laughs> workflow. We should execute one day before the opportunity close date and which is somehow doing some calculation and do the field update, updating the opportunity as 20,000. So on the one side, I have a validation rule, which is saying don't update more than 10, don't allow more than 10,000. On top of it, another field update, which is asking like, which is updating a field more than 20,000. So my question is that, what will be happening in this case? What will be fire? It won't fire. <laughs> You will run into it. So what? Uh, so what will be fire? So um, it, it will fire, but it will produce an error. No. The time dependent one. It's gonna fire. So, so that's the okay. interesting one. So that's the interesting thing here. Your validation rule will not fire. Your workflow will be fire and will update the amount is twenty thousand. There is a glitch. So because once your field update fire, your validation rule will be not fire again. But if it is not a time dependent, it's a normal one, your workflow or work, or field update will be fire, the validation will be fire. But in the terms of validation, or in the terms of time dependent, your validation rule will be not fire and your amount will be updated. Yeah. It's a good thing. I will suggest everyone try in your personal law and play with this. So it's a great thing to learn. Yeah, you say a field, a, a time dependent field update doesn't fire the validation rule, even though it uh, is the first pass to that record. Yes. You're, you're right. The, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, same uh, order of education, it's talk about Exactly. And you don't go that path. And, yeah. and um, this is a really interesting interview question. Like, I mostly ask to any admin. So, yep. So, it's a good thing. And I will suggest, like, play around it. So there's a lots of thing to learn about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's a cool one. I didn't didn't really um, get at that. Um, there, there's a question that was um, the how do you actually use one process per object? I have multiple uh, multiple ifs that would be satisfied and need the subsequent uh, actions executed. Well, this is a um, this is a thing really about best practices, uh, best practice and best practice exceptions, more or less. Um, you, what you can do is um, let the, the rule of thumb is um, you just go to the first node that, you, um, that matches your criteria, go to the right hand side, all through the process builder, and then you can decide, should it re, uh, also evaluate the following nodes again? So this is probably, um, this is possible, but um, if you do all the ifs in your, um, in your process builder, the process builder will get more like a wallpaper or um, a, um, a map of the uh, road that you take from probably Berlin to uh, Beijing or so. Um, so it's, it's probably something where you have to apply some, some good, um, some good balance between creating another process um, 
in case you re it's really so complicated that you need to have one uh, uh, one more um probably you can go one process per um per domain or purpose uh, within that object but it's actually the, the trouble spot is you don't know which of the processes runs first they will run in a specific order but um, you can't say that it's the same in another org as well so really um, that's a dangerous condition and they shouldn't rely on each other if you know what you do everything more or less is fine until you run into the situations that mark has pointed out so be be very careful what you put in these processes if you create more than one um, and another question was process builder can create an event really um is that um, is that event you're talking about is that a an event in terms of the the standard object event or is it a platform event so the question is can the um, can process builder update the event record as well um if you're talking about the standard object event um, pro, um there will be a full save cycle so you will enter the process builder on the event record as well if you're talking about a platform event as a technical um, concept, platform events by definition cannot be updated. So they only have the, um, they only can be inserted into a message queue. And the whole concept about a message is that it cannot be updated in the process. So the question Adrian answered, process builder can update events. That's true for the standard object. It is not true for platform events. Platform events, by definition, cannot be updated. Um, and that's probably all for the questions. If any questions are left, raise your voice now, because um, Amit will close the recording very soon. Uh, so there's another one in the chat. Um, Okay, the, the question is um, that um, there is, um, they're trying to, um, one of the guests is trying to uh, immediately to, uh, to see this in a trigger, um, but doesn't see anything in the analysis perspective. It just a subject undefined. Um, am I missing something? And probably, I'm, I was probably wrong that enough information is um, is collected when uh, when just profiling is set to uh, so oh, it says as object undefined I, I know this um, I have seen this uh, this thing I'm not really sure what uh, what you were uh, what else you need in terms of it's probably database uh, that you need um, additionally or workflow to see the event. Um, probably try uh, try Fina on database um, workflows and Apex. Um, that might give you the the information that you um, that you need there. It's, it's a bit hard for me to um, to give the um, authoritative uh, explanation without actually doing uh, running this all the time. Um, um, but if you use the um, you see the, the thing that I said uh, set there is the database apex code workflow and profiling. Um, for this configuration, you can definitely get enough data. And thank you, Dan, and thank you, uh, Daniel and Mark, for the great session. And uh, I also uh, thanks to everyone who all join on the weekends. So it's a uh, order of execution is always a learning point doesn't matter you are beginner experience and all so we learn lots of new things uh, and the i really love the uh, presentation way like how you put uh, this complex topic into the presentation way to explain it in a very simple way so thank you so much for that and thank you mark thank you daniel thank you for having us yeah it was good fun